yes, so the first talk, um, we have uh, Professor Gerd Brook from Copenhagen University, who will speak about uh, fractional order operators on smooth, non-smooth domains. So the, 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 the idea is that we have half an hour, half an hour talk, uh, followed by 10 minutes questions. So, okay. please, please yeah. start. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm um, happy to be included in this uh, event. And it's the first time I'm trying uh, the Zoom as a speaker. I mean, I've heard Zoom conferences, but I haven't tried to speak. So you hopefully forgive me if I make some errors. Okay, um, here's the plan of what I would say. First, I will remind you of the classical theory and then I will say something special about the interest of fractional order operators. And then I'll go on to the thing, the new stuff, namely the question of non-smooth coordinate changes for the differential operators. And then at the end, I'll tell very briefly how it applies to the fractional order boundary problems. Okay, so let me remind you of something you all know very well, how we define classically a pseudo differential operator by this formula using the Fourier transform here and the inverse Fourier transform here. And the functions P can be of all kinds, more and more general through the time, but I'll start with the classical case, classical symbols, the notation is SM or, or N times SM, consists of C infinity functions PXI, such that they have an expansion in homogeneous terms. So the order is M and it, it's terms PJ, J going from zero to infinity, where the Jth term is homogeneous of degree M minus J in Xi, and only outside the unit sphere, I want them to be smooth, etc. And then the crucial estimate is P itself is O of Xi to the power M, Xi in brackets, uh, and when you subtract J, capital J terms in the expansion, you get something that is O of xi, m xi to the m minus j. And when you differentiate in xi, you decrease by another length of alpha and nothing happens when you differentiate in x. So that's a very classical basic concept from the 1960s. And now I'm going to talk about uh, Hilton smoothness in x. So let me just um, fix the notation C tau denotes the Hilda space CK sigma if tau is uh, the sum of an integer K and a number sigma between zero and one strictly. And if tau is an integer, it's just the usual space of, in, of K times differentiable functions with all norms bounded over uh, Rn. And then the classical C tau symbols this notation C tau is M, consists of functions that, again, they're smooth in Xi, and, and uh, the derivatives in Xi are C tau in X, and so is P itself. And they have, again, expansions in infinitely many homogeneous terms, but now the estimate uh, that characterizes the symbols is, is formulated in terms of C tau norms in the X variable and otherwise it's co completely the same as before. And I should say, I didn't say any names on the first slide, but I should say that this type of symbols were, the study of such symbols was initiated, initiated by Kumanogo and Nagase in 78, and Jürgen Marshall in 87, and several other papers did some very interesting investigations. You can also take other classes in Sitao, but I'm fi I fixed by that attention to the class C tau. Witt has also contributed later. Okay, so that's the symbols. And now uh, I need some spaces and I'll just fix the idea of focus on LP type superlative spaces, those of the Bessel potential type where the elements have, are such as the Fourier transform apply, multiplied by xi to the S has an inverse in LP. Uh, so they extend the usual superlative spaces for integer s. Uh, now, when you take a symbol in the C tau SM class, 
then the operator it defines is continuous from hs plus m to hs for s less than tau. Um, and for C in the infinity case, there's no restriction on s, but the best result you can get in for, with C tau dependence is, is this. Okay, now I will recall some things about boundary value theories. We take a smooth bounded subset of our n, or we, it can be the half space, an important case. And then there's a calculus initiated by Boutin Morvel in, a, in an ACTA paper set in 71, but it developed much more by both Reinbill Schulze uh, in a book and by myself in a paper 84 and a book later and much more. And what is it about? Well, it applies to integer order operators that satisfy the transmission condition at the boundary. I put a zero here for later purposes. So, and what is the transmission condition? Well, it's sort of a symmetry condition along the normal. If you just uh, put J and alpha equal to zero, you can see that it is that the principal symbol P naught on the normal is connected with the symbol on the opposite of the normal by a factor here, e to the i pi times the order. So x is at the boundary, mu of x is the interior normal, and, this, and then this has to hold also for the lower order terms and the derivatives. And that property assures, well, first I should say something introductory um, yeah. things, this class includes differential operators and the solution operators of elliptic problems. Um, they all have this property. And I also need some notation. The restriction from Rn to Rn plus or from Rn to the set omega is called R plus. The extension by zero back, backwards the other way is called E plus. And then we can define the truncated operator. That's the way P is made to act on omega, you extend brutally by zero, you apply P and you restrict back. So you introduce a jump when you do this and it's not uh, obvious what you get when you restrict back. And then the property of the transmission, of the, this transmission condition is that it assures that you get a good mapping here. The truncated operator is a good mapping is greater than a certain lower bound. Here I have to explain the notation h bar over s plus m of s plus m p is the restricted space, the space of restrictions of h s p of r n to the set we're considering. And I shall need the other notation h dot is the supported space, the functions in h s p that are supported. Okay, and then this calculus uh, treats not only these truncated operators, but also other operators, trace operators going from omega to the boundary and Poisson operators going the other way and the way. And they interplay what happens when you compose them and do various things. So this was the good old Boutet Mobile theory. Now the question is, can we do that uh, with, with non-smooth symbols? I mean, remember that omega is smooth, but here there, there is an extension worked out by Helmut Abels that uh, extends the calculus to the C tau SM symbols, the Hölder smooth symbols. And he showed that then here the truncated operator does what you would expect it to do, except that you have to take S between tau and minus tau. So this is a very nice result. And there are many other results on how the whole calculus works. And he did this uh, in order to treat questions for the Navier-Stokes problem. And is as the first large work by himself and then later with co-authors, all kinds of results on Navier-Stokes problems. So that's the recollection of, of, of a lot of known stuff. And now let me get to the special case of fractional order operators, as you know. Uh, you, Fractional orders were not allowed in the Boutet Mobile calculus. So here's the most interesting example, and it has been a fashion, fashionable in recent years to study it because it's non local, uh, 
well, it's it's the the Laplacian minus delta lifted to a power between zero and one. Uh, it's clearly a pseudo differential operator, the operator with a simple psi to the 2a. You have to correct it by a smoothing at zero and subtract that again, and you get something that is in the calculus. And some people prefer to see it as a singular integral operator written here. Here, the, the kernel function is just the inverse Fourier transform of psi to the 2a. And it has been used in probability theory and in financial theory. And it also enters in mathematical physics and differential geometry. And the interest in finance is that the heat equation you can do with this operator seems to fit better than the ordinary heat equation uh, when you want to predict uh, how, how uh, futures and options develop in time. Okay. Um, I'm looking at it from the pseudo differential point of view, and then immediately the whole effort of pseudo differential operators is to allow x-dependence. So, and here, typical examples that are, uh, are x-dependent are the powers of a second order differential operator, the same powers as, the, I mean, we can generalize the, the Laplacian to something that depends on x. Okay, uh, now the Putin model calculus does not apply. Uh, because it's not, uh, well, even if it's an integer order, I mean, the half power, it doesn't satisfy the zero transmission property. But one can still define a homogeneous Dirichlet problem, namely, if you take you, you functions u that are supported in the closure of omega, you can apply p to them and restrict back to omega and ask that that should match a function, given function f. To so say, take a simple case, f given in L2, and we look for u in the supported space of H a, uh, the, the H a superlative space, L2 superlative space, function supported in the closure of omega. And uh, this has a nice uh, solution, namely if p is strongly elliptic, one can simply use the variational theory to define a fret home operator that represents the problem in L2 and the domain consists of those functions for which a plus p u lands in L2. Okay, so it's not a question to define a, a framework for this problem, but the question now is the regularity question. Is u more regular than what is contained here? I mean, the operator is of order 2a, so you would expect some kind of 2a regularity. And what if f is more regular than being in L2? What is u then? Is it better? Okay, there was some re results early in the theory by Vishik and Eshkin and Shamir, but they didn't go very far. And the interesting new or recent results, it's what I'm getting to now. First of all, there was a paper by Rousson and Sarah, Rousson and Sarah, two young Spaniards, uh, published in 2014, uh, that they could show that when f is bounded, then u has this form. There's a Hilter continuous function for suitably small t up to the boundary, and then it's multiplied by the distance to the power a. d is the distance uh, defined near the boundary and extended in a positive way, a smooth way to the rest of omega. And omega was c11 for their result. And they were using potential theory methods inspired from Gilbert Schrodinger's book, uh, things like that. And I got interested in the problem and got the following results after their results. I could show in this infinity case that indeed, when f is better than h is, and then, well, when f is in a sublimit space with, a, with, a, with an s that could go to infinity, then u is composed of two terms one term has 2a better regularity and is supported in the closure of omega. The other term has just a better regularity and is multiplied again by this d to the a. The importance of the also Tom and Sarah result was to show how d to the a enters. And when you let s go to infinity here, you get a result where I can give a double implication that when f is c infinity, then u is 
e to the a times something that's infinity observable from inside. And vice versa, when u is here, then, okay, then f is the infinity. And all this, sorry, uh, here, all this was based on a new theory that I developed from some old notes that I'd been in the possession of from 1980. And Amanda wrote them in 1966 for a course he was giving at Princeton, but he never went on and never completed the notes and didn't publish, uh, except there's a, there's a result in his books which refers to this, but he didn't publish a big theory. And there, that is that when you take a super differential operator that satisfies this condition now called the A transmission condition here, then you can show those things. Uh, so the condition is the same as I had before, except there's a minus 2a here. And it means that when the order m is 2a, then this thing disappears as just e to the i part uh, times an integer. So it's a twisted uh, transmission condition, twisted by the a in this way. And um, what one could show then was that the fractional Laplacian satisfies this and also the other operators I mentioned satisfy this condition. And um, much more has been done in this theory, but I don't have time to talk about that today. The only thing I should perhaps mention is that, that for these operators, you don't have the usual boundary values, but you can get something that replaces them by taking u divided by the distance to a and the boundary value of that, or the in also uh, and take that as boundary values, they will play the role and they will enter in Green's formulas and stuff like that. And uh, the, this implication was also shown in the spaces. Okay, so the both, both of these results are new, in comparison with, with what Wasserstein and Sarah could do, and they show the power of pseudo differential methods. So I thought, ah, now I'll tell applications people that they should just learn pseudo differential operators and then they can do a lot of more things than they are used to. But when, yeah, so but when I've lectured on these things for people in applications, I am invariably met by the questions. What can the pseudo differential methods do when the domain is not smooth, when omega is not smooth? Mm -hmm. and, uh, some things can be done by approximation, uh, but the question in itself, the tool of localization, I mean, carrying an operator at a curve boundary over to an operator at Rn plus and keeping check of what the symbol does. That has been missing in cases where omega is not smooth. And I uh, convinced Helmut Arbels that we should work on this. And we've done that for several years and we completed the work recently. So the, let me get back to the C tau SM classes of symbols. They have composition rules and parametric constructions, but they only handle smooth coordinate changes. For example, if you look into an important paper of Marshall, 88, he has the formula for how the symbol should look. And it has up to the integer less than tau precise terms, but the remainder uh, is not worked out except when the coordinate change is smooth. So it's useless uh, in general. Uh, and I will tell about this by recalling what happens in the smooth case. So let me put up the formulas in the smooth case. Um, Let's take a diffeomorphism f going from Rn to Rn, and there's a notation that would you take f of f of y, you call that f star, oh sorry, v of f of y, you call that f star v. And when you take u of the inverse of x, you call that f star inverse of u. And then a pseudo differential operator over Rn goes over to, but the coordinate change to go over to a the operator underline p by p underline pu at x is p applied to 
u composed with the inverse of f evaluated at f of x and it can be written in short form as f star p f star inverse of x. Okay, and now let me present the formulas that hold and I take for simplicity the case where the gradient of f is close to the, to the identity. Then you define a matrix here, A, X, Y, as a sort of a Taylor formula uh, of, yeah, you take the gradient and you evaluate it at these points and you integrate in T from zero to one. Then you define a function Q of X and Y and Xi by the following prescription. You take the P that was given, but put in F of X here instead of the Y. And here, oh, instead of the variable that was there before, and you take in not xi, but xi multiplied by this matrix, the inverse transpose of what I defined here. And then you have a few more factors. You have the determinant of axy inverse, and you have the determinant of the gradient here. So that gives a function of x and y and xi. And then p bar u is presented by this formula. I think it's already found by Kuranishi, if I remember well. Uh, and where you put in the function q, x, y, x, i. Now there's a y also, so we have to take that into account by putting in the inverse Fourier, tra Fourier transform of, or the formula for the Fourier transform of u. And then you get this formula. And it's called, it's sort of a pseudo differential operator definition, except that you have a symbol uh, in this form, and I call that the x, y form. It's not quite logical, but I call it. You understand what I mean. And then this operator in xy form can be turned to an operator in x form by the expansion formula uh, p underline at xi is sum up to n of this expression where you put y equal to x and then there's a remainder. And uh, so that's how the theory looks in the completely, in the case where f is smooth. And this works also for the Hölter classes. So we take F smooth, and um, then this works for C tau SM when you only take terms up to the length, of, to, uh, up to uh, and less than tau. And the remainder will be in the expected class. And then the question is what happens when F is not C infinity? And this is what we had worked on, and we really simply wanted to see to what extent these formulas hold. Okay, so we take f c tau plus one with positive tau, and and uh, have made a lot of efforts to extend these calculations. And it came out in our key a month ago or something like that. And the crucial step is to look at this oscillatory integral and function q that you get. And to validate it, to show that it, no, you look at this integral and to, you want to validate it as an oscillatory integral. I mean, a, sort of a, an approximate expansion, expression where you put in a smoothing factor and let the smoothing uh, disappear and see what comes out. So that was a, a, a threshold that had to be passed. And of course, we had to uh, make assumptions on tau and the order and, and the occurring things. And then the other thing was to show this reduction from the xy form to x form here, with hopefully as weak as possible assumptions, uh, n should be up to tau. And what about the remainder? Well, we didn't get a remainder symbol, but we got an operator, some boundedness property. Okay, and then finally, I will tell about how it applies to the fractional case. So we also worked on that. And of course, we have to generalize the A transmission condition to these simple classes and to domains that are uh, non-smooth. And we did, uh, and that is simply more or less taking the same expression that I already had on the blackboard, um, but just applying it up to the tau, the limit that's set by tau. And this is in particular satisfied by um, the fractional application. And it also satisfies it in an easy way 
by two different uh, differential operators that are of order 2a and even. I mean, they have this simple symmetry property in all xi, and in particular, it has it when xi is the normal vector at a boundary. So the A transmission condition is satisfied by all operators that have this evenness property, and then we focus on the even operators to get something manageable. And here's the theorem that came out of it, P between one and infinity, A between zero and one, tau greater or equal to one and greater than two A. And then we take a strongly elliptic pseudo differential operator that is even satisfies this with a symbol in C tau of this two A and we take a bounded C one plus tau domain. And then when you initially taken in H A P supported in omega solves the homogeneous Dirichlet problem as I had it on the slide earlier, then for S greater than E to equal zero and up to tau minus two A, we have this inclusion that when F is in HSP, then U is, has two components. One is two A steps better and supported in omega. The other is A steps better up to the boundary and has the factor D to the A, which is exactly the same result as in the case of the smooth domain, except that S uh, is limited. But the interest is that when tau goes to infinity, domain becomes smoother, uh, operator class becomes smoother, then the S also goes to infinity. Uh, actually, there's a, it's a more precise result, uh, if I should just mention that, that U belongs to a certain subspace over here, namely uh, so-called A transmission space. Here's a notation, but I don't want to begin to explain it. And here there's a, a by implication. Okay, so uh, the importance of the result is that it fills out the range between infinity domains and domains with low smoothness. And that has not been done before in these HSP solutions. Okay, so that's all I wanted to tell. Um, so I'm ready for possible questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, very interesting talk. So um, are there any questions? Yes, if I can. Yes, please. Yeah, so I'd like to, to understand a little bit better how can you make sense of that oscillatory integral when you don't have, if you can say a few words more. Okay, um, maybe I'll, I had an extra slide ready, <laughs> but um, it's here. It's the, the general theorem that uh, I was and I proved. And I will look at, at the, this formula here, um, the Q is expanded in the precise terms, here are the precise terms, that are in the expected class. And then there's an operator with a certain symbol still depending on X and Y, which is in the best class you can expect. And then uh, when you take the precise terms going up to and including L, you obtain that uh, that R uh, vanishes when Y equals S. And from this information, we could get back to the, the integral we were looking at and, and make sense of some of the terms in a pseudo differential way. And the remainder term, we could have, we had some mapping properties of that term. And um, the basic, or, or one, one basic step is contained in Michael Taylor's book, one of his books, where he treats exactly this case where the symbol vanishes for x equal to y, then you can step up the mapping properties a little bit, and we had to push this much further. I don't know if that gives you an impression of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I have another question, maybe. Yes, please, yes. Uh, he won't define uh, 
in a similar way, the rho delta classes, rho delta classes, yes, uh, some, some restriction on rho and delta PR he one once that uh, this obtained symbols uh, will be invariant under change of coordinates or something. Yeah, we didn't go into the, the root. Uh, we, did, we didn't go into the road delta classes. We went into uh, the S10 class. Here, okay. what you can do. I mean, everything works in S10 if you let go of the, the homogeneous expansion. But we did not try S uh, road delta. I suppose S1 delta would be the next one one could hope to do. But S10 at least works. Any, uh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? If, uh, I'd like to, to ask another question, if I may. Yes, yeah. yes. So, uh, will you apply this, uh, this uh, theory also for the eigenvalue problem then, to obtain also some, uh, some asymptotics for the eigenvalues? Certainly, yes. It will, it will be applicable to that too. Yes. I mean, because, I mean there, is a, there, is a, there is an asymptotic in the smooth case. Uh, I've, I've written a paper on, uh, five, six years ago, and uh, that's one of the points that it would be possible now to also treat non-smooth domains. I, I mean, I haven't tried. I mean, we just got so far as we, as I've been talking about recently, and and the applications to more many more questions is still open, and we'll keep working. Or I'll keep working on that. And hopefully other people will take it up and use it in their work. Also. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I also have a small question. Is it, um, so in the last theorem, uh, the, the boundedness of domain, is it essential um, restriction or the operator is not local, but how, is it, is it just well, convenience or is it essential? The boundedness of the domain, uh, it, it is convenient when you want to cover the boundary with a finite system of coordinates. But uh, all along the work we did, we are working with a half space or a curved half space. I mean, a half space with a, with a, uh, with a curved boundary um, uh, parallel to, to the straight boundary. And we have many results there. And, and in, in, for many of the arguments, the boundedness is not important. But I would, I would also say for exterior domains, there could probably be some easy, immediate results. And for other unbounded domains, there would be some work to do. But the theory should be uh, rich enough to, to make it possible to do such work also. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in, in, in... May the, also? Yes, yes. Um, I have a question whether this is, this is very deep and complicated. I was wondering... Is it Emma? <laughs> who's who's <laughs> asking? Please. Yeah. My, my question was, do you need yeah. to do it also for differential operators? Because you know, as soon as you have a C1 structure, you have a C infinity structure. So couldn't you argue for a differential operator? Well, I go over to the C infinity structure. And, uh, and then just the coefficients change and they remain basically in the same Helder class. And then I apply um, the usual non-smooth pseudo-differential calculus. This would avoid the step of dealing with the direct transformation of the pseudo-differential operators. Um, well, well, uh... I agree the the fraction of Laplacian is not differential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no. I'm thinking of I mean what I said about localization. I mean, I mean you have several things to do when you have a non-smooth boundary, and one of them is one of them is to go down to local coordinates, and that's where the theory was missing. But you can do other things. You can sometimes you can approximate the the non-smooth boundary by smooth boundary. And, and get some results there and go in, uh, but they they give some results. I mean, they have been used too. Uh, my, my strategy would be to avoid the problem from the beginning, saying, "Okay, I have a C one plus something boundary. 
Then yeah. I know there's also the infinity structure. I have an operator that has C tau coefficients in the in the C1 uh, setting. So it also has C tau coefficients in the C infinity structure. And I work with these and say nothing about the changes. Of course, if you have a pseudo differential operator, it's much more subtle. Then I would know how to do it without that. I was just wondering, yeah. can you avoid it? <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Sure, sure, that would be nice. But and and, and but I, I don't think I have any any anything constructing to say about it. I mean, as I said, there, there are some um, methods that that that, uh, that avoid change of coordinates where you just have sort of an approximate thing I mean you freeze co the coefficients at a point and, mm. and you have a, a remainder that you can iterate away by a non series and stuff like that um, but it has not led to these results and and I could say that that also Tom himself with with other co-authors have, have been acting in working actively on the question very recently, also with uh, on the fractional Laplacian, trying to use his methods, the potential theoretic methods, and mm -hmm. uh, they got with great efforts. They they could sort of iterate their methods that works for C11. They could iterate it uh, one step at a time to lift the regularity of the boundary, and they then they could get a whole result. Uh, Similar, oh, yeah, in, in sort of the same spirit as, as what I've been talking about. And maybe that doesn't answer your question, but surely, I mean, uh, uh, one should try out all kinds of methods. Thanks. We have tried to make this one work, the, the localization. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I, I <laughs> okay. <hope. laughs> Not... we, we can talk about it more. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. That's Yes, very good. Uh, so, uh, okay, that's that's. Um, um, any other questions? <laughs>